Hello guys, I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 through 12. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you would like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. Also, cash app capabilities in the descriptions with Sunday School Lesson Notes. God bless you guys, and enjoy the lesson. Hi, I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday School lesson for June the 4th 2023 is God reigns and our Bible scripture today are taken from a prophetic book it is Isaiah the 52nd chapter verses 7 through 12 for our printed text and we're moving into a different quarter and the quarterly theme that we're in is the righteous reign of God and our our unit of study for this particular month is the prophets proclaim God's power. The prophets. This is that prophet Isaiah that we've heard so much about. He wrote 66 chapters and some debate whether he actually wrote all 66 of them, but I, I kind of believe he did, he did. So we do attribute them to him as we go through this. Isaiah wrote 66 chapters after he was truly converted there in the sixth chapter of this prophetic book. After he was converted, when he had saw the train of the Lord filling the temple after King Uzziah died, and he, but at that time, he saw God's holiness, and he realized that he wasn't holy, and he, he, he proclaimed to the Lord that he, wasn't, he was unclean. He lived among people that were unclean, and we know that the Lord sent the angels to put the fire the, the coals up, up against his lip, as we said a few weeks ago, not to burn him up but to burn off that which was causing him to feel like he was unworthy to serve the Lord in that capacity. But after that, he was willing to go and do the Lord's bidding, to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do. He became the prophet that wrote 66 books. He was a great prophet. He was the one that the historian said, as the Hebrew writer tells us, that was sown asunder, so, sown in half. He was That's the way that they killed him. He had been through many adversities in his life, probably born there in, in the area of, of Judah. But now he's, he's, he's this wonderful man that wrote this wonderful book for us this poetic kind of prophecy as we go through it it takes some time to sit down and, and and try to get the mind of the writer as he's he's going through this and when we get to this particular section of this 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 book of of the prophetic message of Isaiah we realize that there is a change in tone when we leave the 39th chapter and start the 40th chapter the first one through 39 was talking about the doom of this nation that had sinned against God, that had been wrong before God, that needed to be chastised, that needed to be punished for their wrongdoing, for not even letting the land have its rest. And, and God had let them know that these things were going to have to take place and they were going into captivity. Captivity was held off for a while, but finally it came. It came to the northern kingdom in, in, in 722 BC. That was during the days of Isaiah. And, and when, when the Assyrians came in and took the northern territory or the northern kingdom there, there as we see the uh, of, of Israel that was, came in and took them and, and made some of them, them go back with them. But some were left behind. But still, this area was still safe. And it was safe for a period of time. But the pronouncement of them being judged was coming upon them. Many years before a man came on the scene that would help the people be released from their judgment there in Babylon when they would be judged and, and taken by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians into Babylonia to be, to be there at, away from their homeland to, to not be slaves, but they were taken away from their place. They, they were... They were exile 
from their own homeland. They were taken away. They were they were put into this place there in Babylon. Some of them may have, uh, over the years, had good lives there in Babylon. And that was the reason that many of them didn't want to go back when Ezra and all the other guys wanted to were, were ready to return. But the, the wonderful thing about this is that in the 40th chapter, God begins to let the people celebrate because he was going to remove their 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 burden, their the sins that they had done and they had paid for them. God said in the second chapter of verse 40 that they had paid even double for those sins that they had committed. So God it was was satisfied. You have you you've served your time. You have done what you needed to do and now we're going to move ahead. Now we're going to to put this burden off of us and and we're going to let you go back into your homeland. So what, what was God going to do to get them back there? He was going to raise up a person to help them go back to their homeland. The Bible lets us know in the 40, 44th chapter, the verse 28, it says, that said of Cyrus, that is the person that God was going to use. He was a pagan king, but he was the one that was the king of Persia at this time. He is my shepherd. God said that this Persian king was his shepherd. This, uh, he said, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. The 45th chapter of, of Isaiah, first verse and the first verse says, thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. God used this man as his anointed, as one that would fulfill things that he wanted to happen, whose right hand I have holden to, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of, of the kings and to open before him the two levy, levy gates and the gates shall not be shut. Cyrus reigned in, in, over Persia. He, he became, he, he overthrew the, the Babylonians there in, in 539 BC. So in 538 BC, he began to send the people, let the people go back out of, out of their captivity, not in slave ship, but in captivity. He let them, he, he began to let them go back to build, rebuild the temple. Now we know that the homeland was going to be built too because that's what, what God said to build and to, and to the temple, that foundation shall be laid. You, you're going to go back. So he, he reigned in Persia from 559 BC until 530 BC. He had, he had a good long reign. And, and during that time, he conquered many kings. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, I, the Bible tells us in, in 2 Chronicles 36, 22nd verse, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord was spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and to put also in writing saying, 23rd verse, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth has the Lord God given of heaven given me. This is, this is the pagan king saying this about the God of heaven. And he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is at Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. Cyrus was telling the people that I'm going to let you, allow you to go out of captivity back to your homeland there in Judah and rebuild the temple. That was the main thing on his agenda, to rebuild the temple. So as the celebration starts there in chapter 40, we get to our printed text today letting us know the big theme of it is that at the end of the seventh verse in this in our printed text is, is thy God reigns. But it starts out uh, in a wonderful way in this poetic type, type talking in the first verse of this 52nd chapter. So awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. O Zion, Zion being Jerusalem, but he's going to actually use the words, the, uh, both words in this. Put on thy beauty, beautiful, beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, come, uh, colon. For whence there shall be no more come into these uncircumcised and unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem, colon. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion, 
For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourself for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. You shall be redeemed without money. Now, that would help us to understand our, our redemption, how we were bought back. Because we were given over to the world system. We were given over there in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam bombed out, when he ate of the forbidden fruit, we were all destined to die, as Paul tells us there in the fifth chapter, 12 verse of Romans. So, so we were all doomed and dead. It all died because all have sinned, Paul said there. But so we need to be bought back. But how would we be purchased? It wouldn't be my money. A person won't be able to stand before God one day and have billions of dollars and say, well, I'll just purchase my salvation. I'll purchase my redemption. I'll purchase my way off of being sent into hell. It won't work. You will be redeemed if you're redeemed without money. For thus said the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what have I here, said the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught. They, they hadn't done anything at this particular time to be taken away that, that, that I could see that they, t they did so bad that they would be taken away. They that rule over them, make them to howl, said the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name, colon, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doeth speak, colon, behold, it is I. That's the Lord talking. And then verse seven happens in our printed text. It how beautiful up on the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings, that, that good tidings of good. Now that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now, this, this, this seventh seven verse starts out how beautiful. How beautiful up on the mountain are the feats of him that bring good, bringeth good tidings. Now, how beautiful. Beautiful here may not be as it caught up with our English word when we think of something being beautiful. We, we might think of someone that have the perfect features and things like that. But here, when they when the scripture is talking about beautiful, if you looked it up in the Hebrew text, the way that it is written there in the, in the seventh verse, that beautiful is is naha, and in the Hebrew text, it means to be at home. Means that this beautiful means to be comfortable. Means that it is it is something to be pleasant. It means it is something that is suitable or even comely. That's what that word means there. And that doesn't even sound right when we're speaking in our English language, but, but it'll be put together as we start to understand what the apostle Paul meant about this same sub subject there in, in the, in the Greek text. When the apostle Paul said there, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. When the apostle Paul said that he used the Greek word beautiful, and that is Horeos, which means belonging to the right hour or season. Belonging to the right hour or season. Now, here's the big thing. Timely. Just like the word suitable or comely in the word naha in the Hebrew. So these, these words get put together there and, and how, how suitable. How, how timely it is for that person that is standing on the mountain to come down and his feet are beautiful, beautiful feet because it, it's a timely thing. His feet are, are the timely thing here at this, uh, it, it needs to happen at this particular time. His tracks are beautiful. The things, not the tracks that we hand out in, that, that are pamphlets, these are the tracks that he's making because he's coming down off the mountain. Now let's understand the mountain to be Jerusalem. I don't don't care what direction you were coming from. If you read the scripture, it's always up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the mountaintop that he's talking about at this time. A beautiful up on the mountaintop are the feet of him that bring, bring the good tidings. Bring the good tidings. Bring fresh and cheerful things to say. When, when, when they're coming, they're, they're delivered. De bring means to deliver. Bringing it to you. You didn't have to come get it. You didn't have to go get the message. The Lord made sure the message was right there for you. It's timely and it's suitable for the time that we're living in. So so both of those, the, even the Greek and the Hebrew word, fits into this section of, of scripture right here. But he bringing good tidings. 
Now, this is not the good tidings of good because after he brings the good tidings, the good tidings is, is wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It is something that is really needed by the people. Shalom. It, it, is, it is peace. They want peace. That publishes peace. Now, to understand the word publish, it means that this is something that is reported to the people. Published is, is reported. And it's not published, published by someone that is giving false information. This is good news. This is the actual truth. Good tidings. It, 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 so he's bringing good tidings. So it's a good report. The report that is coming is going to be a report of shalom or peace. It's going to be peace, that uh, wonderful time. Now you're battling, now your captivity is over. Now you get to have peace a, even at home. But also it, it keeps on from there and lets you know that it's going to be ap amplified by the next statement. It said that bringing good tidings of good. So the, the good tidings just went to another level. It went to another level. So now it's reported that this good tidings is going to bring deliverance. It's going to bring victory. It's going to bring salvation to all of those that, that are going back home. They're going to be saved. God is going to save them in the light of taking them back to their homeland. We're saved and we're saved one way. The apostle Paul let us know there in that same 10th chapter that we read from a moment ago telling about when he said, a beautiful are the feet of those that bring the gospel of peace. He said that faith coming by hearing in the 17th verse of that same 10th chapter of Romans and hearing by the word of God. But that person report, come and make this report. This report is salvation from our God. So we, in our day and time, we have to look at it from the standpoint uh, of, of we're receiving this salvation and it is eternal. It is salvation because of the person of Jesus Christ, because of the last statement that's going to be in this, that publishes salvation, deliverance or victory that saith unto Zion, saith unto Jerusalem, thy God reigneth. That God is the supreme ruler with a power and authority that is above all. It, it, there is no, no lacking in his power and his authority. He is the supreme ruler of everything. Thy God reigneth is what the prophet said here at the end of verse 7. So verse 8 starts out and says this. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together. Shall they sing, colon, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. This, this is a wonderful thing because usually when a watchman is on the wall, when they are, are on in the tower, they're looking out to see if there's someone that is going to come against the city that is going to try to overthrow the city, try to take the city, try to bring harm to the city. And they're looking at the way that the people come. If they come in a way of peace, then they know that they're not trying to overtake them. And sometimes it's a warning, but sometimes it's good tidings. And this time it would be good tidings or good news in our case. It's not a warning. So the watchmen, the, 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 ground, the, the, ground, the guards of the city wall or the city tower, the, these people, they lift up their voice and look what they do. With the voice together shall they sing. They'll sing in unisons and in perfect harmony one thing they'll have a song that's that they can sing in unisons when when we sing sometimes everybody have their own part but this time it's going to all be in unison and they were going to sing a certain thing after the colon there for they see eye to eye when the lord shall bring again zion they see eye to eye so what 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 does that mean it means that they will see with their own eyes They'll see with their own eyes God returning or the Lord God returning to Jerusalem. As the people come back to Jerusalem, remember he had made his place with his people. So while they were in Babylon, they were not in Babylon without their God. Their God was there with them. So now as the people go back to Babylon, as the people come back to into the, the church house, God is there with them because God, and, and, and my dad and I used to have this kind of, kind of thing that we, we poked at each other every now and then with. And if I was a little late for something at the church, he'll say, well, you know, the spirit has come and left. And I'll pick with him and I'll say, dad, well, he just got back because he's living on the inside of me. But, 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 but the, when the people went back into Judah, God was with his people. 
These were God's chosen people, the Israelites. Even though they had sinned and been sent into captivity, we know that God was there with them because there were men of God that were there with them while they were in captivity. Daniel and these guys that were there with them, Nehemiah and Ezra, these guys were there with them. So we know God was dealing with them while they were in those days of captivity. But now they get to witness with their own eyes God returning to the homeland, to the home city, to Jerusalem, to Zion. So when the Lord shall bring again to Zion, he'll, he's coming back to Zion. As the people come back, God is coming back with them. He's returning back to Jerusalem himself. And then verse nine says, says, break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste, pla you waste places of Jerusalem. Then there's a colon. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Now, at this point, I need to tell you this. Isaiah made this prophecy somewhere during the days of his life. The days of his life was there in, in uh, and his, his prophetic ministry was there somewhere around 750 BC and 701 BC. Sometime during, during that time. And, and during that time, it was a hundred and something years before Cyrus would be born and, and brought on the scene almost 200 years before Cyrus would come on the scene and actually bring the people, tell the people they can go home. So these were all prophetic things that were happening here. But when the scripture starts talking, God is speaking those things it's as if they were already, they had already happened. And it says it right here in this ninth verse. It says, break forth into joy. And sing together, sing in unison. You just start, don't hold back your joyful but, uh, thing about going home, about getting freed from this place, from captivity, being able to go home. The gates are open, the cage is open. Little birdie, you can fly out as Dr. Benjamin Cohn sang, sang his song. He's, and so you can you go, you can go, you're free. Break forth into joy. Sing together, sing in unison. Ye waste place of Jerusalem. Uh-oh. Now the land gets to sing. The land had been in a place of waste. It had been in a place of ruin. It had been in a place of desolation. It had been in a place that, that was called barren. See, yes, there were some stragglers still that, there left in the land, but it, was the, it, was, it wasn't the cream of the crop. So the barren land, barren means that there's no life. So the life was gone and the life was there in Babylon. So now life gets to come back to the city. You and I understand who life is really living in. So we, because we have the gospel according to St. John, the first chapter, the first verses there that, that tell us in him was life and the life was the light of man. So we, we know what, what life is. So wherever God is, there is life. So now this place was, was, was barren without God being in this place. We just said that God, the Lord, they got to see the Lord go back into Jerusalem. So now the barrenness is lifted from this place. And, and now this place is going to thrive again. So after the colon, it says, here is the reason why the Lord has comforted his people. The Lord had soothed his people, not will. You see, he has speaking those things as if they've already happened here in this telling you that there is a, a, a strong confirmation from God that these things are reality. They're going to come to pass, even though this is many years before these things actually did happen. God could see them as if they had, he can see the parade from the beginning to the end, even before the parade gets set to start. So for the Lord has comforted his people. He has soothed them. He has consoled them. He has reassured them and he has brought joy to them or cheer to them. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He's already purchased back. He's already bought back the land itself. He bought back Jerusalem. He's freed the land. He has delivered. That's what redeem means. You've been delivered. You've been bought back. You've been purchased with the only thing we found out earlier could things would be purchased with. It was without money. So we find out in the last verses of this, that's not in our printed text. It would be that one that was marred more than any other man there in verse 14 of this same chapter. So now he says Jerusalem was bought back, freed, delivered. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. It says here, the Lord has, has made bare his holy arm. I know I need to read the rest of that. But when you read that, 
we, we know that this is written in a, in a way of anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism means that there is a humanness put to God. Now, we know that Jesus is all man and all God. But the father, Jesus told the woman at the well, is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But this gives God a reality to man. It helps a man understand this anthropomorphism, puts him in a human state so that we can understand and get a picture of what the prophet is trying to say here at this time. Say the Lord has bared his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. The Lord has rolled up his sleeve. And if you've ever seen anyone that has ripped it would be God himself. And when men look at his, his uh, physique, they, they tremble at, at his physique is, is what the, the prophet is trying to say at this time. Said he's bared his holy arm. He's rolled up his sleeves. And all the nations could see this unmistakable power that is in him. See that there is no lacking or slacking in his power. Seeing that he could crush you just by the power in, in, in him. Even though it's speaking of him in, a, in human text, we know that he is a spirit. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. There at the last board of verse 10. The whole world will see God's deliverance is what the prophet is saying there. Now, all the ends of the earth. All, every, everyone will, will, will get the same opportunity as Paul talked about there in the last verses of that 10th chapter of Romans there. It, it, he, he made sure his word would go out so people could receive his, his message and the testimony of the people that were bringing the message to them. So the whole world will see God's deliverance, his salvation, his salvation, Jesus Christ, his, his salvation through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, this is something encouraging here in the, in the 11th verse. It says, depart ye, depart ye, saying it twice. Go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, it says here, get out. <laughs> it's basically what it's saying. Get out, get out. Get the, you're free now. Why are you staying here? Let's move out. Now, you and I know that there were waves that left Babylon. Everyone didn't leave Babylon at the same time. There were waves that left. Different people took back different groups of people back to the homeland, back, back to Judah, back to Jerusalem. All of them didn't go. So they, they, some of them were encouraged to go, were, were talked to and, and said, let's go home. God, the Lord has op opened up the doors. See, that was, was what told us that they were in captivity and some of them probably in captivity have built nice lives and they didn't really want to leave Babylon, this, the, the, the city of hanging gardens. They wanted to stay there and just hang out. I built my family here and we're comfortable here. But some of them did want to go home. Those that it, the history had been brought down to them and they had heard about the way that God had, had kept, took care of them there in and around Jerusalem before the, 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 the Babylonians came in in 586 and just destroyed the place and left it in desolation. So now he says to them, it's the prophet saying, get out, get out, go ye from hence. Then he says, don't take anything with you that would contaminate you. Now, this, this brings us back to the time when the people of Israel left Egypt. When they left Egypt, they left out with gold and silver, with many different things. And they found themselves in a precarious position because while Moses was up on the mountain talking to the Lord, they thought Moses may not, may not come back and they wanted a God that they could look at because they got used to seeing things like that before the Egyptian people there in Egypt. So they decided to pool all of these things that they left Egypt with and, and melted them down and made them a golden calf. But here they're told not to take anything that might bring them into condemnation or, or something that is contaminated. It is not something that, that is for the things of God. He said, go ye out on the midst of her. Get out of this place. Just, just when it's time to go, just get out. Depart, get out. But look at the last part of verse 11. It says this, be ye clean. Now, everyone needed to be clean, 
but this is a particular message to a particular group of people. The Levites were not supposed to handle the, the artifacts of the temple without going through a ritual cleansing. So here it says for them to be ye clean, though those that bear, and I know those is not there, that bear the vessels of the Lord. Because everybody didn't handle the vessels of the Lord. The vessels of the Lord were desecrated while they were there in Babylon. Remember, one man died because of it. Because, but, but these things, you don't just use these for anything and everyone don't get to, to even handle the things. So it says those that are going to bear the vessels of the Lord to take these things back to the house, you need to be clean before you touch these things. And then our last verse. It says, for ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, colon. Here's the reason why. For the Lord will go before you, and the Lord God and the Lord and the God of Israel will be your re reward. Now it says here, don't hurry when you get ready to go. Don't get in such a hurry that you can't grab your own regular things. Now you're not supposed to grab anything that is unclean. But you can get your things. You can put them and, and, and pack your, your, your suitcase nicely. And you don't need to go and, and get you an airline ticket. But that's just me joking. You don't need to run is what it's talking about here when it says don't, uh, don't go by flight. You don't have to run. Re but remember, when they were leaving Egypt, the deaf angel had just gone through and killed the firstborn male of all the, all the people that didn't have the blood over their doors. So, so the Pharaoh was mad, even though he was going to send them out. So for them to leave, they needed to leave in a haste. They needed to leave in a hurry. They needed to leave in a flight or running when they left. They needed to get, get on out and they were taking things with them that they really didn't need to take with them, but they took it with them and, and, and they left that place. And there's a reason that you don't need to get in a hurry this time. They were, they were protected by the Lord at that time too, by, by the cloud and the fire. But here the Lord tells them, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to go in front of you and I'm going to go behind you. And I'm going to, to take care of you through this whole situation and ordeal. You're not going to have to run. I've, I've raised up this man, Cyrus, just to send you home. He's going to make sure that you can get home safely. So I've sent myself in front of you. And he's going to make sure that you're taken care of even behind. So I've sent myself behind you also through this person that I raised up to send you back home. And I told you about that many years ago when Isaiah talked about this man. And, and, and now it, it starts to happen here. And he says, you don't have to get in a hurry. I'm going to be there with you through the whole ordeal. Why? Because thy God reigns supreme. He is supreme. He reigns. He is the ruler with total honor, total power, and total authority. Our God reigneth. And then this lesson lets us know at the end, if we will read the rest of the uh, rest of the text there in, in this in this 52nd chapter, it starts talking about the reason that the people could be comfortable in the things that they were doing. We can be comfortable in our salvation because of these things. Verse 13 says, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. A verse that I talk uh, often about, verse 14, as many were astonished at thee. His vestige was more more than any, other, any man, and his form more than the sons of men. They beat him, Jesus, beat him to where he was unrecognizable, marred more than any other, the, the scripture lets us know. So shall he sprinkle many nations, and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which has not been told them shall they see, and that which they have not heard shall they consider. Paul said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall receive salvation, shall be saved. In those verses, Paul was talking about getting down to the point where we are in our lesson and talking about those that bring the gospel of peace or the, the good tidings, good, good news. He said, how, sh how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear 
without a preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah or Isaiah said, Lord, this would be the next chapter if we went into it. Who has believed our report? So then faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All of this because our God reigneth. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that person that was marred more than any other. Lord, we thank you that even though he was marred, he went to the cross and died for our sins. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts. Forgive us of sin. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.